Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for uh, this uh, short webinar on pH data logging with Onset's uh, MX2501. <clears throat> I am uh, Richard Rodriguez. I joined, recently joined uh, the product marketing team here at Onset in, uh, this past October uh, to lead um, market activities for outdoor agricultural products and uh, water uh, now, along with my colleague, Paul Gannett, which I uh, assume many of you may have already uh, met uh, during other past webinars, as he does quite a few of these. Um, I am also joined today by my colleague, uh, Jessica Hammond, uh, which will be monitoring any questions or comments you may have. Uh, hopefully you won't have to hear from her, as that would indicate that something went wrong on my end. Uh, we estimate that uh, this recording will take about 30 minutes. Uh, so we have gotten some requests um, over the past uh, few months about doing um, a shorter, more focused versions of our webinars recently. So um, we'll try that out today. Um, this means that we will not have time uh, to field any, any questions outside of uh, those questions we got uh, prior to the webinar. So uh, we do have a lot of folks uh, uh, submitting questions with their registration. So we greatly appreciate those. Uh, but please feel free to enter any questions you may have in the questions box on the control panel. And we will be sure to follow up with you uh, shortly after the webinar in the next day or so. Also, I do ask that you take a couple minutes uh, after this webinar uh, to answer our quick two minute survey. Let us know uh, how we did, what you thought of uh, the short format. Uh, and also, you know, take, uh, uh, take advantage of that to enter any any last minute question you may have and just indicate that you would like someone from Onset to reach out to you uh, so that we can answer those questions. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be accessible on our website in the next day or so. All right, and uh, our agenda for today, uh, I will start with a very, very brief uh, review of uh, what pH is. Uh, we'll discuss some applications. I'll cover a quick uh, product overview uh, and then dig into some product details, key features, and spend a bit of time on uh, calibration, uh, the importance of calibration and how to do it with our new mobile app, Hobo Connect. Uh, we'll talk about deployment, maintenance, and cleaning. Again, uh, I do assume uh, many of you or most of you uh, understand um, what pH is, uh, but uh, I'll provide a quick review for any, anyone newer to, to this topic. Uh, so pH is the power of hydrogen or potential for, for hydrogen. Uh, it is a quantification of how acidic or basic um, a water-based solution uh, may be. Uh, it does use a scale of uh, zero to 14 um, where <clears throat> where uh, that, that scale is actually the power of a, um, a power of 10 um, so for concentration. So every with every unit uh, it, you move up or down in that scale, uh, that reflects a 10 times change in uh, hydrogen ion concentration. So methods, uh, so uh, there are different methods for measuring uh, pH, uh, we use potentiometric, uh, a potentiometric method, uh, which um, for in situ pH measurements uh, in different bodies of water, so ocean, oceanic uh, water, uh, river beds, streams, um, the potentiometric methods provide a, a really leading uh, weight method uh, based on accuracy, ease of deployment, and costs. Um, potentiometric pH systems uh, use glass, uh, often use glass electrodes, uh, which is what we actually use. Uh, these are very portable uh, with a small size and weight, so they're very easy to deploy and have while having good precision and accuracy. Uh, drawback with them is that uh, extended deployments will lead to measurement drift. Uh, this drift can be corrected by regular calibration with pH buffers. Um, 
some potentiometric uh, pH systems use uh, ion selective field effect transistors or ISET, uh, which are known to provide a great option for very high accuracy and precision and in situ measurements. However, these require long conditioning periods of a couple that can range from a couple days to six weeks before the measurements become accurate. Uh, but they are great for long-term deployments. Uh, so if you're, um, if you're looking to really monitor um, uh, acidification of ocean waters over a long period of time, uh, that this may be, this type of device may be more suitable to you. These are, however, uh, much, typically much higher in cost. Uh, again, Onset uh, uses a glass bulb electrode, which makes our pH logger suitable for many applications requiring good accuracy, short hysteresis, uh, so uh, responding quickly to changes in pH and uh, acclimation compared to uh, the ISET type loggers. And now getting into applications. So again, very common applications studying um, ocean acidification. Um, you know, we, we have uh, cases of our uh, loggers, the MX2501, uh, being used um, to uh, study corals and the effect of ocean acidification um, on corals. <clears throat> uh, locally, uh, you know, uh, ocean uh, oyster farming is uh, pretty big here in uh, in the area. Um, so pH loggers are used to check uh, and ensure pH levels are maintained within an acceptable range, especially after uh, uh, periods of say heavy rain, which can um, can affect uh, the pH of the waters uh, where these are, are farmed. Um, and uh, harvesting dirt with bad pH can lead to bad oysters and uh, uh, bad news for the consumer. Uh, also here in our neighboring state in Rhode Island, um, we've got a, an environmental lab uh, monitoring pH of water near a power plant to ensure that there is no negative impact on the environment near the of the water near the cooling towers. Um, actually, more closely, if uh, you look up uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, in the past year or so, I believe we we shut down a power plant and um, and uh, took down two very large cooling towers. Um, and quite a quite an impressive video online for anyone interested of uh, these big cooling towers coming down in the past year. Aquaculture, uh, globally a very common application for uh, for our data loggers to ensure that uh, uh, the um, the pH is being maintained in the in the water around the uh, the fish uh, to ensure that um, they they are healthy, avoid problems. Acid mine drainage. Um, this can have a significant negative impact on the environment um, near the mines, uh, whether it be from initiative of the miners themselves or to meet uh, local regulations. Uh, this is a very common application. Uh, actually, prior to this webinar, we did get a, a, a question about a similarly, similarly harsh environment. Uh, someone asked about using or uh, deploying our pH loggers in a wastewater environment uh, for a period of 35 to 48 hours, um, which yes, uh, the, in short, uh, the, uh, these are suitable. Uh, however, we do suggest deploying in cases where you're going to have heavy fouling, a lot of solids uh, that could uh, uh, attach or damage the, the electrode. Uh, we would recommend uh, deploying the logger and uh, perhaps enclosed in a PVC pipe with uh, some holes drilled into it, perhaps with a, a mesh filter to um, a screen out or a mesh a screen to, to filter out some of the larger debris that could uh, really increase the fouling or attach to the uh, uh, electrode causing it to lose uh, good contact with with the um, water and uh, provide bad uh, bad results. Perhaps the most common application for the MX2501 is just simply monitoring uh, pH in rivers and streams, uh, monitoring water quality for different watersheds. A growing application now. Uh, is uh, the use of uh, pH data loggers in uh, agriculture, uh, more specifically looking at indoor growing out operations where um, you know uh, the uh, pH of water in irrigation tanks is 
often uh, monitored to ensure that the pH is suitable for for high value crops that may be susceptible to uh, changes um, in, uh, in pH. Uh, we did get a question prior to uh, this webinar regarding the useful logging period in agricultural applications such as this. And really the, the answer is uh, complex. It's, there's no uh, straightforward answer because it depends on the fouling nature of water uh, of the water. Um, and that, that would lead to how often uh, you would need to calibrate uh, the device. In most agricultural applications, I would uh, expect that fouling wouldn't be a big issue. Um, in which case this logger could be deployed for up to six months based on the deployment life of the electrode itself. Uh, so the, the lifetime of the electrode would be um, the limiting factor. Uh, memory would depend uh, how long the memory would last. Uh, depends on how uh, the logging interval. So it can log uh, 30 up to 30 days typically on, um, uh, on a minute logging. Um, but uh, the battery life would also last anywhere between one and three years, depending on how many um, on how on your selections in terms of uh, the Bluetooth signal, whether it's always advertising, always on or off, uh, and uh, would you select the water detect feature to save save power that way? Again, uh, but again, the electrode itself would be the limiting factor for total amount of uh, life um, in deployment. Uh, we also did get a question regarding the suitability, suitability for this in water pipes. Uh, that's okay, um, though the Bluetooth signal uh, cannot get through certain materials. So if uh, it's in a metal pipe, you would have to uh, remove the data logger in order to um, read off or offload uh, the data. If uh, you're talking about a PVC pipe, for example, and the uh, there's good contact between the MX2501 uh, and the PVC pipe, uh, you're likely, you'll, be, you'll likely be able to actually uh, offload the data. So oh, we also got a question uh, about monitoring boiler condensate. Uh, so I did look up um, uh, and whether or not this device is uh, suitable for boiler condensate. Uh, so it seems that uh, the that, that would really depend on the uh, temperatures expected in a condensate. Um, the operating temperature range for this device is negative is a uh, negative two C to fifty C or twenty eight degrees Fahrenheit to about 120, 122 Fahrenheit. Uh, so you would just have to ensure that the uh, temperature of the of the condensate does not exceed that. I know that in some cases now, uh, for energy efficiency reasons, uh, the condensate is uh, kept at a higher temperature. Uh, so if that exceeds uh, 122 fa uh, Fahrenheit, then uh, yeah, this would not be suitable. Now, product overview. Our pH data logger, as mentioned uh, previously, uses a glass-filled um, electrode, uh, glass bulb. Uh, and is designed for aqueous environments. It's got a pH range of two to 12. So it's not intended for use in extreme acidic or alkaline environments. It really comes to down to water monitoring and uh, the applications such as uh, I covered. It uh, does require ionic strength of the sample to be at least uh, 100 microsiemens, uh, which makes it suitable for fresh and salt water. However, um, uh, like Pure uh, snow melt may be too pure. Uh, if you're too close to uh, the origin of the snow melt, um, so that um, th this logger will not, is not likely to provide um, good data. Uh, we did get a question about monitoring uh, spring water flow, whether this device is capable of monitoring spring water flow. If uh, you're looking to measure the pH of that water flow, uh, and you're too close to the source, again, this is likely not the best uh, option. Um, however, if you're actually looking to measure water flow itself, we do have a data logger uh, that is uh, capable of measuring uh, water flow and uh, we, can, we can help you with that. So a key feature for, for this product uh, is its low price. Uh, you can uh, you, uh, spread out several of these and, uh, for a wide ranging study without really breaking the bank. Um, 
uh, it's got a robust PVC body uh, for uh, that makes it suitable for fresh or salt water environments. Uh, it communicates via Bluetooth uh, to uh, an iOS or Android mobile device. Uh, pH calibration is quite easy. The marketing guy was able to figure it out uh, without really actually looking at the instructions. The app really gives you step-by-step -step, uh, instructions. Um, it's got uh, battery saving uh, technology. So it uh, goes into low power mode when it's uh, submerged. Um, and again, it's got a glass ball bodied bulb. Um, logging intervals range from uh, one second uh, to every 18 hours. Uh, it has 152 kilobytes of memory, which uh, as mentioned, really the, the app itself will tell you how long uh, you can um, you can expect to, to be deployed and logging continuously uh, at whatever logging interval you select. And now getting into Hobo Connect, our new uh, mobile app uh, for iOS and Android and calibration. So uh, one to uh, pH calibration. An important part of uh, deployment and getting good results is proper calibration. Um, the reason to calibrate is to compensate for uh, manufacturing tolerances, uh, electrode aging, electrode conditioning, and cleaning. In a calibration, uh, when you're calibrating, you, you, you'll you use a minimum of two pH buffer solutions, uh, which we'll get into more detail. Uh, with known values, uh, they're used to create a linear graph of uh, the electrode's response to and producing two correction factors, uh, the offset and slope. So when you're calibrating, you're looking to determine what the slope of the curve is or the line and uh, any offset in the relationship between potential measurement, uh, so with millivolts and uh, the pH values. So when should you calibrate? You should always calibrate prior to deployment, especially with a new electrode or after uh, long-term storage. After replacing an electrode, you'll, uh, you'll have to uh, calibrate. After cleaning or reconditioning the electrode, you'll want to uh, recalibrate. Uh, during uh, mid-deployment, uh, so the frequency of mid-deployment uh, calibrations really depends on, on the application and the environment. Um, our Hobo Mobile and Hobo Connect software will prompt users to calibrate when first setting up a logger. So as soon as it connects for the first time to a logger, it will uh, indicate that there is no calibration file and ask you to, to create one. If it's been... Um, if it's been more than seven days since it was last calibrated, it will uh, it will prompt you to calibrate it. Uh, not required, but it will prompt you to do so. Um, we do got we do get questions, and actually got a question ahead of this webinar uh, regarding the need to calibrate every seven days and whether this is uh, uh, actual uh, is fact or not. Uh, and this really uh, comes down to um, the environment. So uh, harsher environments where uh, where heavy fouling is expected, you'll expect there to be uh, more drift, in which case, yes, you'll want to um, to calibrate more often. In a lot of the applications that I that I spoke to, streams and such, where where uh, fouling will not be uh, uh, as much of a factor, um, you know, calibrating this often won't be needed. We actually have lab tests showing that. Um, uh, as long as the logger was not in this heavy fouling environment, that the sensor is still within specification after six months or uh, of deployment. Uh, actually, prior to this, I, we do have uh, uh, just anecdotal evidence. Uh, do keep one in our fish tank and uh, uh, in the office, and uh, uh, we confirmed uh, one to look at how often our tech support team is uh, calibrating this, and found that there are in fact gaps in calibration that where uh, it goes several weeks without calibration and, and the data uh, seems to uh, maintain quite steady. When calibrating, you're looking for an offset and, uh, and slope uh, to be within a range. Um, so ideally you want your graph, your, your line to um, intersect the y-axis at, at pH seven, meaning your potential or your millivolt really reading would be zero when your pH is seven. Uh, that's a theoretical ideal. However, uh, the acceptable range is plus or minus 30 millivolts. 
You don't need to memorize any of this. Our Hobo Connect app will actually tell display what that should be and what the actual re, uh, value is so that you can uh, you know whether or not you're within an acceptable range. Uh, the slope uh, is how steep uh, the, uh, the decline of the line is. Uh, it will always be negative. So you'll always see the, the line will always uh, decline from top left of your screen to bottom right. Um, so this is, um, uh, this slope is expressed in millivolts per pH and is reported as a percentage. So uh, we'll, we'll actually, I'll show you, share an example of uh, what the display will look like on Hobo Connect um, and how easy, easy it is to, to determine whether you, it's uh, acceptable or not. Um, so what if you get a bad slope or offset? If the slope is out of range, but the offset is okay, uh, that may indicate the buffers may have a problem, such as contamination. They may need to be cleaned or replaced. If the slope is okay, but the offset is out of range, the electrode is likely the issue. So you try to clean and recondition the electrode, uh, and then you recalibrate and see if that fixes the problem. If not, you replace the electrode. If your graph does not have a slope, uh, you likely have a cracked or damaged electrode, which will have to be replaced. If you get a lot of noise or a slow response uh, to changes in, in temperature or pH, you may have a clogged or dirty junction. Try cleaning the electrode. Another cause for, for this, uh, where you, you see a lot of noise in the data, uh, may be big temperature differences between the reference internal electrolyte and the buffer. Um, uh, try letting the two come into temperature equilibrium by allowing the electrode to sit in the buffer for a few minutes. Uh, this is a more common, most common issue I've actually come across myself uh, where you get a, get a lot of uh, step function type uh, um, changes in, in your readings. So pH measurement is no better than the buffers used for calibration. So if, a cali if the buffers are contaminated or used improperly, the calibration will be wrong and all your data will be, will be bad. Uh, so proper handling, storage, and use of these buffers is very important. When calibrating, it is important to have an idea of the pH of your sample so that you can uh, select the right buffers. Uh, you, you'll want to select buffers that bracket the expected pH of the sample. So ocean water, for example, has a pH of about 8. So you'll want to calibrate with a pH 7 and 10 buffer, for example. Um, someone asked about drink, uh, the pH of drinking water, which according, according to the World Health Organization or EPA, and EPA um, should be between 6.5 and 8.5. So that makes, um, uh, you'd probably want to use a three point uh, calibration there and, and start with a seven buff, uh, pH seven buffer, uh, do the pH four buffer and then do the pH 10 buffer. You want to be sure that the buffer and the sensor are at the same temperature before calibrating. If needed, allow the sensor to sit in the buffer for up to 20 minutes to reach equilibrium. If the buffer and process temperature differ by more than uh, about 15 degrees Celsius, uh, you can expect an error to be as great as a 0.1 pH. Um, so in this case, you'd, you'd want to get the buffer in equilibrium with the um, the environment or your sample, uh, you can do this by by putting placing them in a bath or you know sealing, ensuring your bottle is well sealed and uh, dipping them in say the stream uh, that you're going to monitor. Generally, the pH of an alkaline buffer changes with temperature. Actually, this is true for all buffers, um, so it's important when. You, when you get a buffer, uh, try to choose a buffer where you see a, a label uh, indicating how the pH changes with uh, changes in temperature. Uh, for the pH 4 and 7 buffers, these changes are very slight. However, for a pH 10 buffer, these changes are quite, quite large. Uh, you'll want to um, store the buffers in a temperature controlled room so that they're not experiencing large changes in temperature that could alter them. Um, and then atmospheric carbon dioxide can actually uh, affect the pH of uh, buffers, but really 
can lower the pH of alkaline buffers. So um, uh, this is important to consider. Um, so ensure that you always seal uh, the buffer bottles well, and uh, especially with a buffer pH 10, um, as that bottle dwindles down and um, uh, may have more air in it than, than buffer, you may want to consider replacing it uh, as this can lead to some problems. For example, suppose a sensor is calibrated using a pH 7 and a pH 10 buffer, and the slope is about 80% of the expected value. Uh, that sl low slope uh, may suggest a serious problem with the sensor. Uh, that, based off of my last slide, that, that would be your first, uh, your first guess is, well, let me check the sensor, clean it, uh, recalibrate. However, the calib if the, uh, considering you did a calibration with pH 10, um, because it's highly susceptible to atmospheric contamination, you'll want to consider first uh, redoing the calibration with a pH 10 and a pH 4 buffer, uh, and then look, you know, looking at the slope. If the slope calculated uh, with a pH 7 and 4 buffers is uh, okay, it's good, then you likely have a bad pH 10 buffer. So rather than replacing um, the electrode right away, uh, consider getting a new buffer and try that out. Now look at uh, Hobo Connect uh, for the MX2501. Um, so uh, as is, for anyone familiar with uh, Hobo Mobile, uh, functions quite similarly. Um, just a few cool new features, um, but you would um, open up the app and it will uh, start searching for any MX devices in the vicinity. Uh, you would um, select your MX2501. Uh, the app will prompt you, as I mentioned, uh, immediately to calibrate uh, the first time um, the M your app connects to uh, the 2501. Um, it will also, again, uh, prompt you to do this after uh, the more, uh, the, the last uh, calibration file is more than seven uh, days old. Uh, to begin calibrating, um, you would, um, uh, so you would select OK, uh, and then you would uh, insert the electrode, uh, the glass electrode into the pH 7 buffer. Um, uh, this, the pH 7 always has to be the first buffer used in calibration. If you happen to do what I did uh, my first couple times and uh, put it into the wrong buffer, no problem. Just rinse off the uh, the, the app will tell you that um, the pH reading is out of range. Uh, so you just rinse uh, the electrode uh, and start again. Again, Hobo Connect will actually walk you through each step. Uh, it's quite quite easy uh, to do after the pH seven buffer is complete you can either do the pH 4 buffer um, or skip to the pH 10 buffer, depending on your need, uh, whether you're doing a two-point calibration or a three-point calibration. At any time um, you make a, a mistake on a step, at any step, uh, you don't have to start the full calibration over. You can just go and redo that step. So you successfully complete um, the pH 4, I'm sorry, the pH 7, and you make a mistake with the pH 4, all you do is rinse off the electrode and restart the pH4. You'll actually notice that the uh, the small the square surrounding each pH um, uh, buffer uh, will go turn from white to green after that step is complete. So you'll the pH7 buffer will turn green, and then you'll have a green square around the seven and the four, and then when you're complete, all of them will be will be green. When complete. Um, the offset and slope will appear uh, as indicated here. So uh, it may be too small on your screen, but uh, while it will tell you your offset, so here I ended up with an offset of negative uh, 11.46 millivolts and a slope of 95.97%. Uh, right above it, it will tell you to please verify the results before saving calibration. Acceptable offset is plus or minus 30 millivolts. Acceptable slope is 85 to 105. Right there, it tells you whether or not you can approve those. Click save, and you're good to go. Uh, when, you, when you're when you done with calibration, you'll see your, your main screen, and uh, basically, you'll have your deployment information displayed, your logger setup, 
uh, will be displayed. Again, uh, you will see your, um, based on your logging interval, if I selected one minute, zero seconds, that tells me that I've got a logging duration of about 30 days, 30.1 days. You also have a tab at the top, so you've got a tab to select configuration and live data. Uh, for bottom buttons, you've got your, your offload button, your edit button or configure button, and your calibration button. Selecting, um, so when you're configuring, uh, your first step would be um, selecting your logging interval. Um, an estimate, again, will appear to let you know how much memory, uh, how much, how long that memory will allow you to log for. Uh, you can set the logger to begin logging immediately at the next logging interval, which makes it easy when you're comparing data from multiple uh, devices. Um, you can have it start logging at the push of a button or specify a date and time uh, to start logging. Uh, for logging mode, we give you a normal uh, interval. So uh, every minute, every hour, whatever you choose, uh, or burst logging. In burst logging, the device will measure uh, data, uh, will take measurements, but only start recording data uh, when uh, certain parameters are met. Say you, you only want it to log pH when the temperature of the water is somewhere between 30 and uh, 20 and 30 Celsius. Um, and then you can also select to uh, log statistics such as minimum, maximum, average values, and standard deviation. And Hobo Connect, uh, it does provide you a viewer, so you can uh, view graphical data um, of your results in either uh, for either files that you offloaded previously, or you can also view them in real time and live uh, in the live stream of your data. And now deployment tips. Um, so the mo a common method for uh, this can be attached uh, quite easily. Um, the, all our devices come with loopholes and, and uh, uh, slots for zip ties so that they can be deployed easily. Uh, but to share some common uh, two common methods of, uh, of deployment. Uh, one, uh, using a rebar, uh, where you would have a uh, line attached from the rebar to the loophole uh, on the logger, and you can let the logger hang. That, that way, when you need to offload your data, it would be easy to pull out of the water without having to pull on the rebar, uh, offload your data, and then uh, get it back in. Uh, it's important to note that in order to avoid errors and results because of error bubbles, uh, that this angle should never be um, more than 15 um, degrees. So if you're in a heavy current where you think the logger will be floating off, uh, you, would, you would have to tie it down so that it's not, uh, not floating up near the surface of, of uh, the water. Uh, you also would want to avoid it uh, clinging back and forth and possibly getting damaged on, uh, on any floating debris or, or rocks. Again, uh, with the two two slots here for zip ties, it uh, makes it quite easy to uh, to zip tie then down to the rebar. Uh, you'll also want to make sure that uh, with any motion, any movement of the logger itself, or uh, changes in um, uh, water height, uh, whether it be due to current or uh, you know uh, drying up of a, of a of a stream. Um, you'll want to ensure that the electrode is always submerged and never uh, removed out of water so that could dry it out and then when it's back under water, your, your results would be bad. Another popular deployment method is to use cinder blocks. As you see here, uh, to do that, you would drill out a hole uh, on the cinder block uh, and then use a, PV, a, a small section of PVC pipe with some holes attached to, uh, I'm sorry, some holes drilled through it um you would insert the logger there uh the purpose of this is it really keeps um uh, keeps large debris away from um from the lo data logger debris that could cause damage uh to the data logger uh while also allowing water to uh flow freely around the data logger um, for security you'll, uh, we do recommend uh adding a line uh, in case it does dislodge, that you don't lose your, your data logger. Uh, 
And finally, maintenance. Um, so uh, the glass bulb really is the, the uh, component here really needing attention. Uh, the glass bulb must always be stored in uh, proper pH um, storage uh, solution, uh, never in distilled water. Distilled water will actually, uh, while you can use distilled water to clean it and rinse it off, um, storing uh, the electrode in distilled water will uh, cause it to dehydrate. Uh, if a storage solution is not available, uh, you, uh, you can always use a pH 4 or pH buffer solution. Um, Never leave um, the copper guard attached to it when, when storing. Uh, you should always try to, uh, when uh, we're uh, cleaning or storing uh, the glass bulb or, or replacing it, it's important to never touch the glass bulb as uh, um, that can um, uh, leave impurities on that glass bulb, uh, mostly you know some, some uh, oil. Um, if you do touch it, uh, we recommend cleaning it uh, right away. Uh, mild dish soap uh, detergent can, um, uh, can, can do the trick and then you would want to recalibrate. Um, the logger should be recalibrated uh, each, uh, each time a new electrode is put in it. Um, and then uh, you want to consider the shelf life of uh, storage solution and the electrode itself. Our electrode has a life of about 12 months um, so we, given uh, our deployment lifetime of six months, we recommend you never have a, an electrode stored for more than six months as that will negatively impact uh, the deployment life. And how to clean an electrode. So the more common, uh, more, more, more common cases, you'll have loose scale or some small debris. Uh, you can rinse the solids off the tip with, uh, with uh, water from a, a, a wash bottle or squirt bottle. Uh, you gently wipe the glass if needed, only if needed, with a soft cloth, cotton swab, or a very soft uh, bristle, br uh, bristle brush, uh, something like a, a toddler's toothbrush. Uh, oil and grease, uh, you can wash uh, the bulb with mild detergent uh, solution and uh, rinse, rinse thoroughly with water. And then hard scale being the, the toughest to, to clean off. Um, you would want to soak uh, in a solution of 5% hydrochloric acid, um, or uh, we've, we've had some folks in house do it with uh, successfully with uh, vinegar. And uh, that ends our presentation for today, our short presentation. Let's see how we're doing for time. All right, well, again, we're always here to support you. Uh, I do have up on the screen uh, contact info for us, uh, whether regardless of where you're located, we've got someone there to help you. Uh, always feel free to reach out to me directly. My contact info is down at the bottom. I'd love to hear from, I'd love to hear from, from you. Again, I'd like to remind you and ask you to please take a couple minutes to answer uh, the very short uh, survey we have. Let us know what you thought of this uh, uh, this short style type uh, webinar uh, compared to our typical hour long long webinars. And uh, let us know, indicate that you would like someone from Onset to contact you with uh, if, uh, if you have any questions and uh, we can help resolve those questions. Great. Thank you all again. Have a great day.